Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Midnight Chats, the interview podcast brought to you by Loud and Quiet. This evening, our guests are Faris Badwan and Rachel Zafira, who are collectively known as Cat Size. You may know Faris from his work as the frontman of the horrors, and you may also know Rachel from her solo work. We featured Cat's Eyes last year, uh, around this time last year, in fact, when they were releasing their second record, which was uh, a film soundtrack for Peter Strickland's Duke of Burgundy film. That soundtrack went on to win a European Film Award last year, which we speak a little bit about, um, as well as the band's third record which is coming um, around June time and is called Treasure House. Uh, As well as that we talk about Paul McCartney and my fear of spiders. It's probably the loosest of all the midnight chats we put out so far but that was always the intention of this series and uh, it was it was great to spend an hour or so talking to Faris and Rachel who um, as well as being uh, as well as being in this group together also are in a relationship together and that I think adds to um, adds to the entertainment of having a conversation with the pair of them let's dive into it now the point in which we join the conversation is uh, right at the top of us meeting and uh, we take a Polaroid picture for whenever we uh, we do these and uh, what we're discussing here is how terrible we all look in this particular Polaroid. Is that why am I why am I so white? <laughs> <laughs> You're just very very pale. Oh, we can't use that one. Look, I look like I'm really drunk in that. That's like <laughs> yeah, that, you do look a little drunk. What, that, <laughs> what's with the like? That's look, how I'm I look. Like in. That. I was okay. desperate not to blink. <laughs> we, that's not you, the best side of any of us, is it? That you don't look that bad. You just, I do. I, that's how I look in no, every look, like, one, every one of my wedding <laughs> photos. You look really, you're really? Not really yeah. pleased with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I I ruined every one of my fo- wedding photos by doing that. Oh I think it's like it's, it's the really flash. difficult. Really, yeah, yeah, it might really be. Difficult. Yeah. Some people can just do it. I'm just I will always be rubbish at that stuff. I'm I've worried got, I might be anemic. Good. That one's pretty good. That's fine. Uh, I, and that one's worse for me. <laughs> do you think? That one cannot be that. Why Why am I? Um, we have to do it. We have to do a, a composite. Lo- like yeah. that, I'll it's like a, the blood has one. been taken out of my. What am I that white? You're very, very pale. You don't look as pale now, though. As we here. have this thing like when Rachel, when she was a kid, yeah, she I'm thinks. Not... Um, my mum told me I was. She goes olive around skin? saying, "Yeah, her mum told her that she was olive skinned." So my she whole went, life, I whole thought life, I was. Yeah, filling she out. She thought forms. she was dark skinned, but she's one of the palest people I've ever met. Yeah, I would actually fill out forms. They'd be like <laughs> Caucasian, color. whatever. I'd put ethnic. <laughs> <laughs> it was great because I'm Italian. But when I was little, I was darker though. You've seen the photos where I'm like, I was, I was like. How are you in the sun? I go brown in the sun. Okay. But actually, since living in London, no, you don't go brown. There oh isn't my any God, sun. You haven't even seen me in the sun. Yeah, when I, I've, now I have to send photographic evidence because you're making me sound like. But I did. I was quite. I was darker. Yeah. But now London, I think when you don't get used to the sun, then it does change things yeah i think so yeah. it's just weird because i actually thought i was quite dark we've ruined you <laughs> england has ruined you how long have you how long have you been here like half my life now so, okay right yeah yeah, yeah you're just ruined the that's it the skin's gone i'm english that's my mom's it. irish so i think that's uh i've gone over to the the irish skin now sure rather than the italian cool well um <laughs> well thank you guys for coming in um we we're we're not normally in a studio as posh as this. We normally do these in our office, which is down the other end of Hackney Road, which is quite a good thing, actually, because on our office wall, there's actually a big picture of you, Ferris, um, <laughs> from, from when the horrors were on the cover of the magazine. And it might have been it might have been a bit weird to for you to sit under a big picture of your own face. Mm. You know, Paul McCartney does that at, at uh, this cafe in St. John's Wood. They've put up a picture of really? him above the seat that he... Would you really keep coming in? Well, he... The last time he was in a different seat, but they did put the picture of him above his <laughs> regular seat. 
That would be but that's that's another the, level, isn't it? That's surely yeah. the quickest way to stop him coming <laughs> yeah, in, isn't it? That's, yeah. he, I think he's been going there so long now. It's like a loyalty thing. Oh, I'm going to go and I don't want to be <laughs> Awkward. Yeah, but they would have probably the first, you know, he would have come in and they would have, Paul, we've done something really special yeah. for you. We're really, you know, it's really great. We love you coming in. Here's a massive picture of you underneath. Oh, you know, like, Just to draw more attention to yeah. the fact you're in here. <laughs> yeah. That would, that would make a great picture. Like yeah. a photograph of Paul <laughs> yeah, McCartney definitely. drinking his latte underneath yeah. a massive. It's w- porridge. It's porridge. That's what he eats, isn't yeah. it? Who's the football? There's a footballer who has a, um, a life size bronze statue of himself. In oh his front, God. I think it's oh, Balotelli. Yeah. I, w- I mean, that's probably a bad thing. OJ myth. Simpson had one, didn't he? Did he have something like that? Yeah, that's big brass really statue of him. himself. There's a lot of I weird footballer so. cliches, like when they get their number sort of, um, you know, printed on the snooker table, like yeah, their shirt number, you know, like that stuff. Yeah, it's funny. Do they, um, do, what it, do you know what era the Paul McCartney photo is of him? Is it like I current? I can't remember one? it. No, I think it's an older one. It's like a 60s shot. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a Beatles. I can't work out if that's weirder or not. I I'll take it, a picture it, of it and show you. I, I, it's So it's in St. John's Wood. Yes. There's also at Abbey Road, there's pictures of Paul McCartney in the canteen. Right, okay. From like when they recorded there. Right. Like in the canteen. So when he goes there again, it would be, he's queuing for the food in the photo. Something like that. They're in this exact same canteen and they've put the photo in the canteen. Do you th- do you think that someone like Paul McCartney though is he's so used to seeing images so. of himself? Yeah, it's not pro- maybe it's not like an issue to him. Yeah, I always think of the Beatles like how many times he would hear yesterday on our, yeah. on the radio in the car, or he walks into a store or something and he'd hear one of his songs. I yeah. guess he would just be completely. No, he's used been to it. brainwashed. He's like yeah. it's weird, but he's brainwashed himself. But do you know that story about him walking to Abbey Road from his house and um. A, a Japanese tourist asked him for directions to Abbey Road. Oh, really? And he gave the directions. And they, he gave lengthy, like... Well, they just didn't recognise him. <laughs> no idea. I guess they were looking for, like, the mop top. You know, like, they would have... I think he's cool. There's not really many people like him. Now, no, right? no. I mean... No, he was lahi fun and hilarious. I guess it wouldn't happen very often. I'm a big fan of him. Yeah, me too. I'm a big yeah. fan of the Beatles, generally, but I'm a big fan very of him. Very suspicious of anyone who's... You know, who doesn't yeah. like the Beatles. It yeah. becomes about something else. Yeah, you're it right. It does, isn't it? I think that about... But Paul McCartney seems to be, he, he gets quite a lot of stick, doesn't he, from those same people who kind of yes. dismiss the Beatles and they yeah. all think that he's like this embarrassing dad. Yeah. But I just think if I was Paul McCartney and I'd done what he's done, I'd be I'd be an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be a nightmare. Yeah. Um, and he seems so, you know, normal for someone so huge and yeah. famous. Yeah. I don't think he can be normal. He seems to really like people. He like, seems to genuinely like sharing stories yeah. of the Beatles yeah. still now you know yeah. like that he would happily yeah tell the same story that everyone's heard but maybe you've not heard it straight from him yeah but he'd happily go into that yeah 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 he doesn't get he doesn't seem jaded or uh no bored of anything yeah, yeah. he's I also like <laughs> you when we were there you saw him with his his son and he just seems like you know a really you know loving dad you know just mm. he does seem like a completely normal person yeah so you guys recorded in abbey road or mixed the orchestra record. okay we record there for the on the new record yeah some of it okay. some of it was done a long time ago mm. it was done over a long period of time this album because we've done it over soundtrack. four i mean four or five years yeah probably started writing it maybe five years probably started writing it before the first one came out yeah actually. yeah some of the songs are oh, wow um were written before the first album so was it just that that you wrote those songs and then they just didn't fit on what became the first album? No, they evolved. No, no, no. Over I time. mean, no, the first album was finished, but it wasn't yeah. out. All right, okay. Uh, and we and we just wanted to. We can write quite quickly. I mean, I guess. Yeah, we just write for fun. So there's just. Yeah, we do it when we're at home. You know, we have a lot of things. To, we like to. You know, it's yeah, it's a, it's fun for us. But I think um, I don't know. Yeah, it took about yeah nearly five years. Yeah. And we kept writing new songs. Um, and we did orchestra stuff at Abbey Road that wasn't used. <laughs> it's just sitting there, you know, like mm. full orchestra, maybe the next album or something. So how does that work with recording? I'm always fascinated how it works with recording orchestras. Do you hire an orchestra and yeah. you play them as much as you've got? No, you they, write, I write the scores for them. You write the them. whole thing? Yeah. Them. Oh, because you can do that. It, it's easier. They just position. go in there and play it. Most people don't do that. I mean, you know, if I... 
if I was if I say I had a song and I wanted to go okay I'm gonna go put orchestra on it I'd go you know and find some classical musicians and say here are some really simple chords I've done can you write the whole thing Rachel on the other hand will write every single part you know note for note the whole thing and sheet music and then the people will come in and just play exactly what she's written yeah then they can do it in one take yeah I mean it's not expensive no it <laughs> really keeps quick. the cost down it does but it's kind of cool because it's um I guess that sort of illustrates the difference between us you know my my approach is uh you know a lot simpler I love orchestrating but it's a lot easier than people think it is but, there, but you, are need doing to, anyway. you need to know in your mind I guess you need to hear all those parts separately right but you can hear them so when you're listening to like pop music or rock music you can hear the bass line right yeah and so that's all so, you're doing right, okay. you get the bass line and then you find a bass instrument in the orchestra to play it you're just like delegating parts really and so as long as you know the instruments are you know in the high range the medium range the low range you're just spreading it out sure and some of them sound better together than others it's a very simple thing to do and i i think most bands should try doing it because so they're always hiring string arrangers and then the, all the strings are doing are holding notes you know for it's like really they're just playing chords i find yeah. it really annoying because i think you know every year the festival circuit you get some band who you know they've got the brass band because it's like you know what i mean they, yeah. they've like added the thing and it's not even got anything to do with yeah you know, they, they haven't thought about what how it goes or whatever it's just we're gonna get a yeah because it looks like yeah but i think uh i don't know it's only like it's not like you have writing completely new you're just writing things that complement the chords i don't know it's colors i guess people maybe just get overwhelmed if they just think they think, instantly an think oh i can't do that but that's the same re reason people don't write songs you know they think oh i can't write this whole song now you know but you can't you have to write first bit and mm. then you start building on it do you think there is a like an kind of innate knack to writing say melodies like? yeah i think some people Cause like paul, like that's paul, paul mccartney i was just thinking him too gift, when you said that he? but he's got the combination of having ear for melody also being a bit cheesy in his taste yeah, which is important because beauty. then but that is important because people identify with it yeah and it connects with people and he, yeah, he, he wants to connect with his songs. Yeah. Whereas John Lennon had a similar thing, but he was more kind of... Lyrics. Well, he's away from, like, he's just, he, he had a bit, he was a bit more, like, on himself. The focus more on himself. And yeah, Paul McCartney is more, more hard about on his other sleeve people, or something. Like, yeah. You know, like, the connection to other people. Yeah. I like the sentimental melodies and stuff. I, I always think about, I, I always talk about Nino Rodoff, who did the Godfather thing, but... He, he got criticized for doing corny melodies, quite similar to Paul McCartney, but they stood the test of time more because there was an emotion. He was being himself and being genuine, mm. and all of his contemporaries were doing clever things um, without any sentimental or emotional connection, and those things are now dated. Yeah. But the stuff that's genuine and emotional and coming from a human being, it lasts. And so Paul McCartney being corny, to some people, it's, it doesn't matter because it's him. So it's just going to last more. It's taste changes over time, but you know, emotion doesn't. Yeah. A friend of mine tried to once, um, we had a kind of a bit of a heated debate about, she was saying how she doesn't like Paul McCartney. She likes John Lennon. And the reason she doesn't like Paul McCartney is because she had a, has a theory that no, um, all the best pop songs, all the really good pop songs, are about kind of pain and sadness. And if they're about love, they're about unrequited and love. And he's happy. And Paul McCartney's like happy. He sings about being in love, yeah. you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Like silly true. little love song. That's not true on any level. No, it's not, is it? We, we, we mm. had this real back and forth about it. But I, I actually I agree, think his but... happy stuff is some of the best. It's hard to write a happy love the, song. Yeah, this is it, isn't it? it mm. is, it's a lot harder to write something like silly little love song. Yeah, there's another one that is, for me, the perfect example of his sentimentality one what is the one he wrote i think it was about heather mills actually it's definitely cheesy but i i love it hmm. i just love it i think it's beautiful and I, it just i agree it's with how the, he was feeling i agree with the um the thing I'll about look it up after. the best the best songs come from a negative place though i think really that, well in terms of like it, not maybe the best but the ones that I, i'm just saying that because i find it easier to write but i mean like i've you know like it's easier to write that's why i'm impressed like yeah it's easier to write a song from an english and 
yeah happy is like oh, it's tough. that's a whole other gift like yeah. you don't it's harder to it's harder music. to identify with other people's happiness that's yeah why it's just like that's true and it's whereas about, you that's can true. go with other yeah. people's pain so in terms of your music what kind of mood would you say is on the new record for example i think both of us when we're writing come from not happy but you know like it's i i would say it i don't know if it's simple as that no because I, because uh, when I write melodies or whatever, I that's I feel, you know, that's kind of probably one of the most fulfilling things that I can do. So I, you know, maybe lyrically, but I mean, I don't know. I think uh, I don't know if happiness is that creative. Maybe I don't know. You've got some some, uh, especially on the new record with the orchestration. Actually, that's quite um, quite uplifting and light. A lot of that mm. is this record. This is your second record, but do you? I always wonder where does so you had the um, the Duke of Burgundy soundtrack last year. Does that count? Do you guys count that as a record? Is is this like I your do. third record? I I do. I don't know because if... the Duke of Burgundy thing. There are songs and everything. It's a pretty complete album. I would say, mm. and I I would at, totally put that in our catalog or something. It's... Yeah. And it went re- that went so that went really well. You guys can because you were we featured you in the magazine around this time last year actually mm. um when you did the photo shoot in the cinema in the rio oh yeah oh yeah yeah and that was all around that uh, around that soundtrack and since then of course the, the that was just before the film come out the film is now came out and you won the european yeah. uh film award for the soundtrack um how, how that so that how was that evening going to that kind of what was that it that was, was really fun. fun. We had a great time. Yeah, that, that was, was really fun. Really fun. It was in Berlin, right? This, yeah. This ceremony, yeah. I think uh, you know this kind of. I think with maybe just because we're in London, I think a lot of the music industry stuff it seems, you know, a little kind of boring. But I think uh, you know the uh, the film awards was actually so fun because the people were. I think for me, I don't know about you, but I was expecting it to be kind of elitist, or we wouldn't be really meeting that many people or I thought it'd be very formal and stuff it was but quite relaxed wasn't it it was kind of people people, people were there so nice who uh, people there who love what they do yeah you know mm. yeah it was we met so many interesting was there not so much ego there no e- I mean I didn't see any I mean I guess everyone has an ego you know but yeah. I didn't see it so do they give you what's the setup there do, the, do you have a, is that one of the ones where you have like a meal do you have like a sit down meal and then there was a thing, a thing the night before, okay. like a reception where they everyone kind of met everyone they were into. So Vim Vendors was there. I'm a big fan of yeah. his, and then and Charlotte Rampling and people like that. They just sort of they gave us our certificates and and then we had a meal. So at that point, you knew. You knew? Did you know you were? Yeah. You'd won. It, yeah. It wasn't one of those ones where you're sat there. And no, you're, other people had of, that. Right. But we were told before we went. And you go up and do a speech. Did you do a speech? Yeah. Did you get a speech. Who did the? Who, we both did. You did a bit each. Yeah. Then there was a party. Yeah. Uh, that sounds really fun. It was really fun. I I actually I mean I was I I was surprised I got quite starstruck by Michael Caine. You know I sure. I, oh, yeah, I love saw he him. Awesome. He's a pretty charming guy. Is it? You got to meet him. Did not, not really. I, I, no, Rachel, I fell in front of him, didn't Rachel. I? <laughs> I got tripped. Really? He said hello, and then I went, I went down like a hot air balloon in my big puffy. Yeah, we dress. were walking by, and Rachel was kind of so shocked that he'd said hello. Yeah. She sort of like, you know, sank down. Not he knocked you off your feet, it, he, quite literally. <laughs> yeah. It was really your fault because was I was really wearing right. very high heels yeah, that I wouldn't look like my a shrimp. fault that you were wearing really high <laughs> if shoes. I'd been with someone who wasn't six foot seven or whatever oh, I, I would right, have worn okay. flat shoes and right. I wouldn't have fallen <laughs> I'm six foot six you don't have to exaggerate my height I think it's six not, foot six and a half but say, I'm not even sure but next to him it's just I like come up to his waist it's kind of like it's similar to the olive skin thing you know Rachel has had this sort of thing since she was a kid that she's tall and (laughs) I'm five foot seven I'm not I'm like I'm not like you know four foot nine or something but next (laughs) next to him I I look I have a I have a similar thing going on with my wife she's five I want to say five four see I'm taller see I'm taller I'm in the taller range of women it doesn't tell you anything I'm like six I think I'm six five, but I'd say I'm six four actually. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I feel I feel self conscious about being 
at all. Do no, you? you're lucky. He doesn't. He bought brothel oh. creepers. <laughs> yeah, that was funny actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, His platform shoes. I think you've got to go for it, haven't you? You know, it's like if you you know you spend your whole life, you know, the jacket's too short, trousers too short. You just you know you might as well just go Embrace for it. Right, it. you know, we're going to roll them up, you know, and like make it even just like ridiculous. And then he goes to a concert and he's uh, like, that's, <laughs> no, but I never. That's, that's where I get that. I, I that's where I feel self conscious. Actually. Oh it's, it's, really? It's really only at concerts because you stand by a pillar. That's what it. I have to do. I've got to I've I can't got stand to by. It. Just give up the dream of standing at the front. I've got. To, well, I have a rule, which is I'll stand if I'm late and like the band are about to come on. I'll stand as far. I'll stand at the back of the room, back against the back of the wall. Really? Because I think like the you know I can't start to. It's best by the sound desk anyway. Push in. It sounds best by yeah, the yeah. Yeah. Every every else sounds rubbish. Like the, the guy is doing the sound from one place. You might as well stand where he is because yeah. that's. Where you're actually... But in like a smaller venue, the sound desk might be right, you know, on the back wall anyway. Yeah, that's what I mean. I remember that. I remember there was a when I was a kid. I I I, w- I was unaware of these things, you know, like height and their you know their effect on other people. So I used to try and stand at the front of festivals, and people used to get so pissed <laughs> off. That I just I I yeah I gave up. I remember that some like these two these two guys, both about five foot, kind of having this really like passive aggressive conversation in front of me. Like, <laughs> Really but good. about you, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been there. I know that feeling. <laughs> but the um, so so the set, the whole. Th- I mean, that's a such a lovely way to end that whole process of releasing a soundtrack for a film to like win an award for it. Yes, obviously. and to yes. win an award so, so. that it's a great it's ceremony amazing. and it me- you know it really means something. Um, how did you find the whole composing music for a, for a soundtrack? Loved it. For, I mean, for me, it was like winning the lottery because this the film was so good. Yeah, the director was so good. We'd never done it before, and he gave all this trust. But we were involved from before the shooting and everything, which is cool, you know. He yeah. Was like the, really from the, you know. Yeah, he would send beginning. a photo of the location, and that would give a really good idea of oh, so the music, you know, the music should match yeah. this. I think house. Peter. I think Peter has actually. I think his films have more depth than people realize, even even the people who enjoy them. Yeah. You know, I think there's um, having you know seen the film a lot. I mean, it's actually really funny. So when you've kind of so having having kind of made that soundtrack, how does it feel like when you come back to like to doing a cat sized record that's that's not attached to a film? Very different. Well, we stopped and then we started again, didn't we? I mean, we we had to pause our second album to go and do the film for a year. Yes. Yeah. Did you record the new album in the 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 term that um, I think it? was sent to me with the record was in a deserted town in Canada. that's weird that's i think something no we recorded it true. here at real world oh Studios. Didn't even, not even in canada no oh, we right. went, i mean we went no we just went on a trip we, we went oh, okay. to canada <laughs> we we did all the uh we did a lot of stuff then we wrote a lot in the record there's a lot of stuff about yeah you know about growing up in isolated places or whatever going back to the past it's just that i brought ferris to my hometown which is a really unusual place he came in the summer and really it was almost it's like a 14 hour drive away from vancouver yeah we drove from and it vancouver. gets more and more remote as you leave you vancouver. don't see another car for yeah. sometimes three hours you know what's it called well it's in the kootenays it's that must be quite if you if you're not seeing cars for like, like just like gets it's pretty just road run. that yeah that must be quite what was fun, really crazy kind of about it was it was um there were massive forest fires mm. uh i mean to put it into context a surface area bigger than, uh, like bigger than London, got burnt. You know, just black, like raised to the ground, like all the trees. It was like a park. It was like the end of the world. Yeah, and you there was driving like fire helicopters and like plumes of smoke, and you know, so we're driving through just this, you know, a road, and it's all like something off, you know, like that that Cormac McCarthy adaptation film, you know, the road, mm. it's something like that, you know, just like literally black, like all nothing the trees but down. wilderness around. There's yeah, nothing no but animals. wilderness for hours and hours. And then you basically you're driving through the mountains and then you drive down into this hole. And then my town is in this hole. And in the hole, there's like the world's largest lead and zinc smelter. <laughs> so, and the smelter is larger than the town. Right, okay. And it's in this beautiful idyllic. There's, you know, mountains and, you know, the Columbia River. And then this smelter in the center of the town, which is where all immigrants, like my dad from... Italy, his family, they gave jobs to immigrants. The town is actually kind of, it used to be like 90% Italian or something, you know, it's, but it's, it's just beautiful nature-wise, but then completely cut off from the rest of the planet. 
and with this with these lead fumes wow. coming out and mercury going into the river that we used to swim around in. Oh, wow <laughs> <laughs> they did all these tests and the kids in my town they thought you know the lead and the mercury were Poison. making us all kind of freaks and monsters and stuff um but so far <laughs> so how so what, at what age did you leave were, were uh, you there 17 till? okay oh yeah. right okay a long time yeah oh yeah yeah i grew up there and then and then my family left eventually so they're on vancouver island now okay but you went back to take yeah for to, the first to, to time in ages yeah. yeah and so i mean it was just i'd always thought about ferris you know, and you know, so I feel like I've known Ferris my whole life. So sometimes I imagine he was there in the town, and what yeah. like it would have been like if he was there. There was a bear in the um, in my front yard. We drove to Rachel's childhood home. There was a bear in the front garden. <laughs> the forest fires they were driving them down. They're so always they there come, anyway. They come down to, to to like nick the fruit from people's trees. Yeah, they go through the it's garbage cans. Massive black bear and... in the front garden, and that wasn't even the first. That that was. He the... didn't believe me. I was like, yeah. "We've got to buy bear spray because." And he, bear. <laughs> yeah. he thought I was being over dramatic. <laughs> yeah. I know we really in the should end, buy we got, bear we spray. We got the bear spray. We got the horn. We got the little bell <laughs> that you attach to your ankle, so they know you're coming. So they run away. They will run if they hear a little bell is enough to let for them to like. I don't think the bell worked. I just thought it was funny. I was like just kind of humoring the guy in the shop, like, all right, I'll get the bell. You know? you I guess do, he wins. Yeah, you know? they do get scared if you're. You're bears. They don't want to see humans. No. They, if you yell before they see you, they'll stay away. They're not. They're not aggressive. Sometimes they're hungry before hibernation, though. You know, I mean, you don't want to take a chance. You really don't want to. If That's there's a cub around, a, you're, you're mouse, finished. A mouse yeah. <laughs> like, to, to bears. I don't know, but it, you know, for some reason, Rachel is more freaked out by the the, the idea the of the mice. Mouse. Because for some reason, mice love me. Though actually, we lived in a place once. There, the ma- it would meet me at the top. I would open the door, and it would be waiting for me at the top of the stairs, it's like, like welcome home. Isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. What I'm... And then when he's around, yeah, you know, they just, they're in, they don't... He used to think I was making it up. Yeah. For me, it's spiders. Oh, I love spiders. I don't. Do mind you? Them. Yeah, don't mind them yeah, at all. That's fine. I can't. Yeah. I can't do spiders. I could do anything else. Really? Yeah. Like so rats, snakes, cockroaches. Mice, cock- yeah, cockroaches. Fine. Oh, it's just spiders. Spiders are so like gentle and kind of clean. And I know, stuff. but they move in that in that quick way. So you'd I rather what, you'd rather have a rat, the feeling of a rat on your foot, than a spider on your foot. Yeah. Yeah, oh. I would. I would because really? it's not really the feeling of it. Do you worry the, you're going to, like, damage the spider? I don't know no. what it Isn't is, but I can't thing? even look at, like, if the, I was watching oh, the TV right. and there and a, and a spider, like... Is it the creepiness of them that they're, like... I think like, so, yeah. That they're quiet? Some Someone tried to explain it to me with the, the idea that... So if that, I do that? Yeah, see, I don't really like that. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's a good picture of a spider. He did that pretty quickly. That was quick. Well, come on, it's a dot with like. I mean, like that looks that looks pretty. That actually like, bothers you. To it see. doesn't bother me too much because I because I because you've just drawn that and I've seen you draw it, but I don't like that. That does creep me really? out. Really? Yeah, it does. I'm totally aware of how irrational. Do it is. Do people play like, pranks on you? Like put a rubber spider in your no, cereal box? And no, stuff? I mean I. I did learn at school very quickly because I've got an older brother. I learned to never yeah. show my weakness. Yeah, you know? yeah, so yeah. Like, so if we are at school and there's a spider there, I, I knew at a very early age, don't freak out. Don't yeah. show that that bothers you because that's going to go in your hair, right? Or wherever. Yeah, yeah. Um, because my brother would always take the bait when I used to wind him up. So so I'd kind of like... Younger ooh, brother? No, older, older oh, brother, oh. yeah. But I remember I did work experience once at like this music PR company when when I first left like university or I was in university, and we were sat there and I was going through this kind of and it was like day one like uh, an hour into it and I was op- had to open on that post, and I was oh, kind no. of sat on the floor next to a sofa, and this big spider kind of came out between the cushions. Oh. And like that Did you was scream? no, I didn't. I managed to like not scream, but for the rest of the day, I was on edge because oh, I knew there was God. a spider in there somewhere. Can't really help it though, can you? You just program to every type of spider. Find certain things. What about ants or no. other insects? Oh, it's so a tiny oh. spider. No, this I'd say, like the Daddy size, long legs? the size that I'd be okay with would maybe be up to like a five pence piece. What about the thickness of the legs? Mm. Is that important? Cause you know that the is ones important, that, yeah. The, so yeah, like, like the, the ones that are really wispy and kind of almost. I'm, like I'm okay with it. Oh, okay like daddy long legs. But that's what I wonder because some people yeah. they they get freaked out because they imagine 
tarantulas? Accidentally pulling off its leg or something. You know, like that bothers some people. Does that just bother you? I it's a know. common thing. I don't know if it's because hmm. they look so alien. They look like kind of I, nothing I guess else. So. What about centipedes? No, I'm fine. What? Oh, yeah, so I, like I a think, few legs bother you, but like I think it's funny the legs. idea of things looking alien because you know like, people made. You know what I mean? Do you, we, people made the idea of what looks alien. What about scorpions? That, yeah, a, that's true. It's a weird thing. I always think it's weird when people say things look alien because, like, you know, we've created that. Yeah. Everything mm. looks alien. Like, look at, no, what about nothing crabs? looks alien. That's my point. Like, you know, sea yeah, creatures, yeah. all the, like, insane yeah. things in the sea. Yeah. I love, looking, like lobsters. At, I love looking at all those animals. They just, you know, don't make any sense. Crabs? Crabs on the beach. Crabs on the beach. I mean, it's basically no one's scared a spider. Of, no one's scared of crabs. Yeah, the, I, th- I think the other thing You've is... No one's scared of crabs. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of crabs. I've got a prawn phobia. Yeah, but that's different. That's What's the, what would the taste of prawns or the... I, I can't stand looking at shrimp and prawn. I what? can't look okay. when people see, order see, I'm this. like because of my spider thing. I yeah. would never say to anyone, "Oh, that's weird," because like I know mine's weird, right? Like my my. Fr- my I thought you were going to do the opposite and be like, you know, how can you be scared of you know, like no empathy, whatever? They've just got like, eyeballs on antennas idiot. and stuff. It's just some weird person hundreds of years ago decided it was a good idea to eat a prawn. It's like this big bug. Paris, you've got a weird phobia, right? I don't know, actually. I don't think I do. I'm sure I have got a weird one, but I'm trying to think yeah. what it would be. Oh, no. Oh, oh. ice. Ice. Oh, no, that's sound. No, that's sound. <laughs> i got a problem with certain sounds, but everyone does that. You know, like the oh, chalkboard yeah, thing, but it's the, with you, me, that's it's very a weird extreme. One, like the, it's ice. Well, the sound of uh, some... Open the freezer. Just can't he, I it. can't describe what it's, it's this weird ice sound. He... My head in. I can't do yeah, he has it. The ice cracking. No. No, no, it's like, uh, it's the drawer opening. No, it's something touching the freezer ice. Drawer. It's the freezer drawer. Where you get all the, the, um... No, yeah, no, I know the ice. sound. I yeah. know the sound. It's but when it's sh- kind of, when there's too much ice, like, round the sides and yeah. you pull it out. Yeah. Yeah, I know Can't the sound. Handle it. Yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. Really? I, I, I mean, I, because of this spider thing, I always <laughs> say to anyone, I say, that's fine. I've, a friend of mine's scared of baked beans. <laughs> but there was, did you ever see, mint. if you look on YouTube, they have weird with phobias. Mint. With mint? Yeah. Mint? Yeah. The taste of mint? The, everything Every, about mint. smell of it, everything. The taste definitely and the smell, but also the way it looks. There was someone on a show like Maury Povich or something, they were scared of pickles. And they on yeah, the show they great. brought out like a big thing of pickles and she was like crying and stuff. It's really <laughs> it's cruel, worth watching. Isn't it? Yeah. It makes you wonder if she would have a problem with sex. <laughs> oh my god. Well, don't you think it would be mate, that would be you know the first thing I would think, is it like you know? No, what's because going on? for the same reason that spiders and crabs it's just it's about the pickle, not yeah. the shape of the pickle or <laughs> When I was a what kid think of, like, my uh, my little brother, one of my little brothers was scared of uh, inflatables. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so he's uh, we had two. We had, uh, you know those like those sort of punch bags. You know you punch it and it goes, you know, and it yeah, comes yeah. back up. So we had a teddy bear one. He was terrified <laughs> of. It's like weighted down with sand. And then we had a Jake the Snake wrestler one, which yeah. had a small hole in it. So if you inflated it, you know it would be this, it's quite big, sort of like you know probably about five foot tall. Um, but because it had a small hole, it would just sort of slowly deflate. You know, like sort of like. Tss- and and he really the way it moved just terrified him, but I've managed to find one on eBay. I'm gonna give it to him for his birthday. I he's, wonder he's if now, he'd still be. He's now 27, so hopefully uh, uh, 26. He's yeah. Um, but inflatable teddy though, that's quite an odd one. So the new, the new record it was called Treasure House. I think the thing on this record that I'm, I'm guessing a lot of people will pick up on this is um, the way it's structured with vocals on kind of the first track is a far, like is Farrah singing and then there's yeah. Rachel singing and then Far- and it kind of flip flops between yeah. the two um, which I think re- works really nicely and works really well but what was the kind of thinking behind behind that and how are those tracks worked mm. on are they but sometimes there would be it's there are sometimes when it suits the song and the I might have written a song about me and it might have been me singing on the demo but then it suits Ferris's voice in it, the song sounds completely different with a man singing it and coming, he also just performs differently than me and it changes and it's always interesting to try the songs with both our voices. I mean Rachel's demos are actually kind of cool because they, they're quite a different thing, it's almost like um, Almost like a different song Yeah, 
but almost you know the how something like maybe the moldy peaches or something is like really kind of lo-fi and like intimate and whatever rachel's home demos have a have that kind of like bedroom quality which is cool and then they turn into something else when we do them together i think i think what's kind of cool is that i you know at least for me who is more interested in the sound and like the, you know the sonic stuff i think we definitely try and write songs that will work in different ways and different settings you know and and you can kind of produce them loads of different ways and they'll work so it's you, yeah you, know, you can be i don't know there's a lot of scope to do stuff with them because they're simple you know yeah like on the first album we did you know we did a song at the vatican and mm. we like that song was rearranged to be like a sacred song for a mass and we kind of like the challenge of having songs that can be redone in a completely different atmosphere or genre even in some ways that's more fun and more of a challenge than just yeah. to kind of shock or you know or anything like that i think it's it's harder to you know to make something fit than it is to 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 make it just s stick out and with, with the vatican thing it was more like uh, you know that it's be anyone can just go in and like i don't know like you know, unveil the Nazi flag, or like you know, like do something just like you're a flash horrific. mob or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, if you do something that no one even notices is happening, that's kind of a cool challenge yeah. that you know people wouldn't think to do. Yeah, well, I mean, they're all praying to her song. You know, like yeah. it's just <laughs> yeah, weird, really weird that one. Yeah, what I was gonna say, what was that like? Because that was your first gig, right? Yeah, your first gig yeah. was at the Vatican. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, firstly, how gig. does that kind of come about? And also, what was that like? So I'd done, I'd gone to the Vatican before and that was how it started. I kept my contacts from that. And I realized it was possible to bring a choir to the Vatican to sing at a mass. If you know what you're doing and you know who to write to and stuff, you know, I, I thought I would see if I could get a proper professional choir to a mass. And then I thought if we rearranged the song for choir and the big cathedral organ there, um, you know, then we can, we can blend in. So I wrote to the contact under a different name and, and made up a choir, you know, like the choir of St. Mary of the Angels or something from Dublin or, you know, I can't remember, you know, I had a different <laughs> name and we were, you know, a really professional, very Catholic religious choir. I grew up Catholic and okay. stuff. Um, so I know the mass setting and I, so I knew we'd have to get a choir to sing you know, the introit, the offertory, the communion, the closing, we'd have to do a full mass. And so the idea was that we would do some of the traditional sacred stuff and you have to do all the prayers in the mass. So they have to know, you know, that stuff. So it was a lot of lying and emailing and, uh, you know, proving to them that we were a proper choir with a good reason to come. And that the last song of the mass was going to be this Katza song, but I ch I said it was Psalm 23, you know. And anyway, they all speak Italian, so it was just you know we're from Ireland, and this is an English, you know, Psalm 23 with English lyrics, or whatever. You have to give them all your repertoire and stuff. And then we we went. I've I've been there before, so it wasn't as scary for me as everyone else. Like the record label. <laughs> came and yeah. you were you're i mean when you go in there it's so you're supposed to be intimidated that's the whole idea behind it's the vatican and the insane. catholic church it's a, fuck, it's a massive cathedral it's, it's covered built to in make gold. you yeah it, it's, <laughs> it's built whole, to make not, you feel you know, small and insignificant next to god insane. so you go in there and you feel small you're supposed to feel intimidated it's that's like looking at a mountain or something it's just like it's so intense like these massive things i don't even know how they would have done it i mean yeah there's so, and there's so many people there yeah just yeah. everywhere, like yeah, every day, the, Pope the whole was time. There that weekend and stuff yeah, and were you worried at all that like you were going to yes. be found out? Yeah, we yes. thought well, we had to go through the metal detectors. You know, for some reason they didn't, you know, take like. But they didn't. Yeah, it was funny because the cameramen ch did chicken out. They right. were at. They were. They panicked. They someone. And luckily, one someone that we came with who wasn't supposed to be filming noticed that the people who <laughs> had been flown to film weren't filming. So luckily, someone like noticed that and was. Yeah, because I've Otherwise, seen the film of it, yeah, so yeah, yeah, so that's from that, right? There were clips from others, and then someone luckily filmed, you know, the whole thing, but some people didn't even take their camera out. Right. Even though there were tourists filming, they just got so scared by the whole thing. They thought they were going to get arrested or something. It was weird. You're they like, thought, I, mean, yeah, I don't know what they thought. It they was just... hard at the time, though, I remember, because it was kind of, 
I mean, I don't know if I would have been worried about. F I probably would as well. I don't know. It's, it was just there I was think a lot Ollie of security. Did get to his, they did say we thought it wasn't he was on the altar, so they said you had to put your. They did stop him from filming, and that might have freaked out the others. But they were tourists were filming with their phones. What was really funny about it though was um, the choir girls. Yeah, I don't think we've ever actually told anyone this. It was uh, so we. It was the thing that almost stopped it from happening. Yeah. So the girls, we, the girls with us, the choir girls. The uh, the people at the Vatican were worried that they had their dresses were too short and they were showing their legs. Right? They were it was down to their knees, yeah. but it was still had to be. So, they so the only way we could they were allowed to perform was if we went and bought them tights. So uh, so they had we had to like our manager had to go and get go and get all these tights. He had to go to a girls. lingerie store at yeah, the Vatican. To, like cover cover the um, uh, cover the girls' legs. And uh, this other guy, who is this, this other guy with us? He's just a friend, a, fr a friend of a friend of uh, uh, the guy who drums with cat size. So he he took our manager to this lingerie store where they would buy uh, buy the tights. And our manager was trying to pick the most plain uh, they had plain to be tights. Opaque. Yeah, like the kind of you know most boring tights imaginable. And the guy with him was kind of I guess like a bit of a sort of like a, maybe a bit of a kind of playboy kind of type. <laughs> you know, he he was saying stuff like. Oh, it's so boring. Couldn't they be a little more, uh, you know, a little sexier? Maybe you're like completely missing the <laughs> Got point. Got carried away in the lingerie <laughs> store. <laughs> so he's like trying to convince our managers to get the girls all this like, like sexy lingerie and like not just not sinking in what he's there for. <laughs> but the, actually, the tights almost ruined the whole thing because we were short on time, you know, and they had right. to get on these tights and they had to find these. There was a lot of weird stuff that we didn't obviously we couldn't put in the in the film. Yeah, I know we should have filmed the behind the scenes stuff really yeah. because it was a crazy story. Uh, that's the only time I've ever seen you a bit nervous. Really, it the other yeah. funny thing was, I was I was nervous because they didn't let me try the organ beforehand, and it's this every massive... organ is different, you know, and they've all got different buttons. It's yeah, all in different you have to places. go through the settings, but then it was just like, okay, here I go. This yeah, here we go. Hope for the best, but yeah. from my view from the organ, watching the record label like Seb Chu from Polydor looking around, you know, they were kneeling, you know, they didn't know where they were kind of shell shot because they were <laughs> yeah. suddenly at the Vatican, you know, in this mass and trying to play. Everyone was trying really hard to like act not suspicious, which made them look more <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> they were looking around like we have to kneel now, you know, and now yeah. we're going to stand. And, but when really it was just, once we were in, it was fine. We just had to get there. Yeah. It's an amazing story for a first gig. Yeah, like, it was, it was pretty fun. It's kind of like, where do we go it from here? Just... It was fun, though, you know. It was, um, that's, I think, maybe... I don't know. I don't think... I want to do more stuff like that, because yeah, it's fun. But that's exactly it. Like, after doing, you know, other bands and stuff, I just... I want to do stuff that's fun. I don't want to yeah, do the like, conveyor belt stuff, you yeah. know. It's just, if it... Yeah, I'd just rather take risks like that, you know. Yeah, and try stuff out, even if, even if it had failed. It's so worth trying yeah. stuff out like that. I mean, you've got a chance to do something like that, and it should be fun. And yeah. when, if this is ever not fun for us, we're not going to bother doing no, it. No, we would just stop. Thank you very much to Cat's Eyes for, uh, for being this week's guest on Midnight Chats. If you aren't too familiar with the music that they make together, I um, highly recommend it. There's that Duke of Burgundy soundtrack from last year, which is a beautiful piece of music. And uh, also that debut album from a fair few years ago now, maybe even five years ago. And they've got Treasure House coming in June of this year, which uh, for me, for my money, is the best record that they've made so far. So uh, keep an eye out for that. They um, have just posted up their extremely, I don't know if offensive is the right word, but it's a um, it's a disturbing watch, their new video for a new single drag. Do check it out, but beware that it's, uh, it's a little gruesome. That's all from this week's Midnight Chats. We'll be back in another two weeks. Um, that's the rule. That's how we're doing this. A new podcast at midnight every other Thursday. So um, we will have something new for you then. Until next time, thanks for listening.